we're starting where we began the first part, namely at the Earl Grey Public House. That was a big building, it was a big public house, with a big lamp in the middle of the road. That faced 4th Street. Now we go opposite, opposite to the shops that we've been talking about, namely near the Steamboat Public House, and we come to a shop on the corner of Long Street. That was a little general shop. Sold everything, sweets, laces, firewood, coal, coke, things like that. Next to that shop were six nice little cottages. They were nice little cottages that you all went up them on two stone steps. They had little windows, bedroom, window as well. And they had a window down below and they had another window near the park. Well, that was loaded into a cellar. Invariably, the coal was shot down there. They all had these. What they saw out, the Lord only knows. I don't, because that was full of plants. Well, those six cottages had were all the same with their, with their grating and with their plants. Well, next to that was a big building on, built on the Dutch architecture with big round stonework on the top of the, the second floor because they had a big second floor there and they had tapered finials on the top of these the top radius of these the stonework that was a social settlement well had a number of a, so, a solidly built brick building they had a number of windows in it opened out on a latch no sash windows, and that had a big door in the middle. The other side of that door was another set of windows. The whole building would be about 45 feet long. Well, that was built by a benefactor of the town, namely Daniel Ford Goddard. He built one or two buildings in the town. Well, it was a social settlement which anyone could join if they cared to pay tuppence a week. If you were a pensioner, receiving about five shillings a week, then you got in free. No one questions your age, you just went in. Well, they used to have cinematographs in there, where we boys on a Saturday afternoon would pay a penny, and we'd go in. We made no noise because we daren't. There were many in there would soon turf you out. Well then we'd watch the cinema, and that was only about ten minutes walk from where I lived, so we used to go there Saturday afternoon, particularly if that was raining or cold. Well then, then they'd have the women's circle there. The women in the surrounding places would go there, and there'd be a sewing machine available. There'd be the old tortoiseshell uh, fire, or... Uh, a, a, a pot-bellied stove, as that was called. It looked like a barrel, but it was stoked up with coal and wood, and that was always near a wall, because the pipe got hot, and that was put through the wall, and the smoke and fumes went up outside. That was nice and warm. There was no carpeting on the floor. It was swept, and when that was swept, you needed a mask to wear because that was so dusty. Anyhow, there were all forms in there, and the women used to sit round in their little squares with their four forms making a square. That perhaps someone would do knitting, someone would do sewing, but they merely got on there. Someone would be there at a trestle table and hand out cups of tea, which if they were in the social social settlement club, they subscribed each week. Somebody would bring some homemade cakes, or if they got a little more money to spare, they'd go to the the baker across the road, or invariably the baker, as in those days, would donate a lot of cakes to these people, because some of them couldn't even afford cakes. That was hard enough to buy the bread. Well then, if there was a political meeting on there'd be a political meeting on so if that was a conservative that would be decorated with blue ribbon 
but if it was a labour meeting, they'd be delivered, uh, decorated outside with red. There was no crop, no squat, no squabble, no fighting, no shouting. They went in, they Come had in. their meetings, and they had their discussions. Well, what was next to that then? Next to that was a garage. Well, you could call it a garage. That was a one-story place with two tall doors, about 12 feet tall, with glass in them, and glass windows either side. Now, if they'd got a car for sale, they'd push that in there, and they'd pick, cut that one side. That was a car for sale. And at the back, there'd be someone in the dim and distant back end repairing a car or perhaps doing an odd job for somebody. Next to that was another row of cottages, much like the same as we first had, but they were a little bit bigger. There were four of them, that's right, four of those. Next to that was the, a gate, and that led to a public house called the Sorrel Horse. Well, that also was cobbled. Well, in there used to go the, the country t carrier. Well, the country carrier in those days not only delivered the goods to the people in the country, in this case, Levington and Nacton, in that area. That was old Baldwin. Old Arthur, Fred Baldwin used to That's do that. Right. Well, then, there used to be sufficient seating in his horse-drawn cart with a canvas hood on to take about four villagers who had been shopping in the town. I'd take more than four, Ted. Well, that's all according to how much he got together. Yeah, but he had a seat that he could get three <coughs> either side. Well then, what used to happen, if these, if people from Levington or Nack had wanted some goods from Ipswich, they used, they used to tell him what they wanted, wrote on a piece of paper, right. and he used to do the shopping for them, and paid for them, and he asked the shopkeeper to send their errand boy down to the sorrel horse, and they were left in a in a stable, and he gathered all his stuff up, loaded them on his cart, and delivered them to and the people home. that wanted them. Well, next to that was a big shop on the corner. Well, there was a well-known forage march merchant, as they were called in the town, who kept bales of straw and hay, mm. dog biscuits, chicken food, oh, yes. everything. And that was on the corner. Was well, that Barnard's? Barnard, I said Barnard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you came to Church Street. You crossed over and you come to a big old building there. That was a doctor's house. That's all I can tell you about that. Then there were some small cottages again three or four, and then you came to Jackson's the chemist. Well, that was kept by two brothers, both smartly dressed men, and they always had a flower in their buttonhole. One wore a dark suit, and one wore a grey suit. Very smart they were. You went in there, that was a double-fronted shop, again, that was old-fashioned, with old-fashioned timbers round the, round the windows. You went in there and they had, I think, four big glass bottles. They were about three foot high, filled with different colours. Red, yellow, green, blue. blue. And they, they, you saw them as you opened the door. Again, they had a rough wooden floor, but there was some lino at the counter which was on the left as you went in. And smelt of perfumes and disinfectant and everything. Well, he was, they were both liked and they were both well known in that area. Incidentally, they faced the Neptune public house that we've just spoken about. If we got a splinter in our finger, we often did, we were sent to Mr. Jackson and he took it out for us. We used to say, Mr. Jackson, well, I have. I've got a splinter in my finger. All right, my lads, sit down. He'd get his tweezers and he'd squeeze my finger 
and you take it out. Perhaps there'd be a big one. Perhaps there'd be a little one. And he used to charge us a penny for taking that out. Well, or sometimes we'd, we'd go in, got a piece of dirt in our eye. I've got something in my eye, Mr. Jackson. All right, lad. And he had some wonderful old chairs in there we sat on. Beautiful shaped things. I suppose they cost him <coughs> about ten shillings each. But I don't think you'd buy one now. Under four or five hundred pounds, I don't think you would. So you used to sit on the chair, which I, and you would have it all squinted up, and that was watering like Billy O. And he'd say, right, we'd have a look. So he'd get a matchstick, and he'd twist a piece of cotton wool round it, and he'd wipe your eyelid inside. There you are, my lad, and you'll see a little bit of black dirt or whatever it was. There you are. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. How much is that? He said, well, that's hiding. <coughs> that's for the cotton wool. And he knew us all. He knew our names. <coughs>